Good morning, so thanks for joining us today. I'm not Tracy, as you probably know, I don't match your little face outside. Tracy sent her regards, she didn't get to make talk today. Um, but for those new faces, of which there are quite a few, which is really exciting, uh, we are the WA Life Sciences Innovation Hub. We're a three-way partnership between the University of Western Australia, the Department of Jobs, Tourism, Science and Innovation, and the Growth Centre for the MedTech, Pharmaceuticals, Digital Health and Biotech uh, sector, which is MTG Connect. So our aim in WA is to foster jobs, growth and opportunities in collaborations. Uh, one of the main activities that we do is this Spotlight series, where we can angle two leaders from the sector and uh, get them to spill the beans a bit on their leadership experience, um, their companies, the journey that they have taken to get here, and what some lessons and advice there is uh, that they can share with everybody else. Uh, we are recording the session, so uh, if anybody wasn't able to make it from your business today or they wanted to catch up on what we're talking about, encourage them to check on the MTG Connect socials and website in a few days' time, um, and they will see it there. Before we begin and I start grilling you both, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we meet today, the Wujak people of the Noah Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Before our last spotlight of 2022, we have Recky Pharmaceuticals with us. We have CEO James and CSO Michelle, and we're going to pick their brains a bit about the Recky story and um, what some things they've learned along their way in their, in their roles. Um, as with any spotlight, if and when you have a burning question, please feel free to just yell them out. Uh, we've got a nice small group today, which means that we can be open and candid about what we're talking about. It's the best way that these sessions work. Um, and then we will just repeat uh, for the sake of our speakers and for the sake of our recording, repeat the question again on camera. Um, so that we have it on record. But for now, I would like to introduce James and Michelle, and would love to start by just having you introduce yourselves uh, and Recky Pharma. Yeah, well, look, thank you, and uh, hello, everybody. I'm James Graham, CEO of Recky Pharmaceuticals Limited. We are an infectious disease company tackling the global infectious disease crisis, and we're really focused on the hypercellular mutation that is bacteria and uh, virals, viruses themselves. So beginning with the end in mind, this technology is a West Australian technology created to overcome that hypercellular mutation or superbugs. Uh, the technology itself is particularly uh, spread across unmet medical needs such as uh, sepsis, septicemia or blood poisoning via an intravenous infusion of which we're just completing our phase one at this moment. Topical as a, a technology for infected burn wounds, where we've been working out of Fiona Stanley Hospital with the wonderful team there. Again, uh, topical for diabetic ulcer infections in uh, New South Wales. And I, I believe another, certainly another, a, a suite of uh, infectious disease compounds in their preclinical stages. So the company is, uh, is a sum of all parts. It's about 13 people in size. It's about $120 million uh, worth of market capitalisation on the Australian Stock Exchange. I actually looked at um, the West Australian listed biotech companies and, pleasingly, we're actually the best performing uh, biotech company on the Australian Stock Exchange by quite a margin over the last five years. So certainly for those in the room who are shareholders, and there's quite a number of you, we, are, we thank you for your support. Um, Michelle Delizio, my colleague with us today, first of all, is clinically deaf. So I do sometimes paraphrase things to Michelle as she's very familiar with my voice, but in all of her brilliance as co-inventor of this new class of synthetic antibiotic, uh, Michelle really made that discovery that this company is built upon and has taken it all, all the way through to these human clinical stages. Did you want to add to that, Michelle? Oh, thank you, James, for that a glowing introduction. Um, so yes, my position with Recky is Chief Scientific Officer. Uh, my background is microbiology. I'm a qualified medical scientist. And it was my privilege, now I've been with the company for some 10 years, uh, to join with uh, co-inventor and founder, Dr. Graham Melrose, ex-Johnson & Johnson Healthcare, but also a pioneering uh, polymer chemist. And he had that light bulb 
moment where he recognized a molecule uh, in the chemistry of anti-infectives and with polymers and had the idea, look, I think I can take this molecule and polymerize it in a way that it will treat uh, human infection. And a unique and really groundbreaking feature of the technology is its universal and uh, multiple mechanism of action. That means that it will kill not only gram-negative bacteria, but we've tested gram-positive superbugs and run it through demanding serial passage tests where it will keep on working despite bacterial mutation. And that, that's been a key concept because, as we know, we've got antimicrobial resistance rocketing. We have excellent antibiotics, but they're also limited uh, in that their specific mechanism of action won't keep up with bacterial mutation. We're hoping and believe we have a brand new class of antibiotics, anti-infectives that can shift us out of that challenge and address some of the very significant global health problems before us. Fantastic, thank you so much. Michelle, could you tell us more about how Rekin Pharma got started in the early days? Yes, yeah, certainly. So uh, again, it was that light bulb moment, that unique opportunity uh, where we got chemistry and anti-infectives joining together. So two quite different industries. Uh, the uh, polymer was um, reproduced, synthesized, optimized, and then it was uh, my job to come in and, and test and see if it would be effective against a range of bacteria. Uh, a big challenge, we started off with a really uh, a very small little laboratory space in Technology Park in Bentley. And gradually we, we started with simple organisms. So I started with uh, E. coli, which I, I like very much. It grows quickly and it's not fussy. Uh, we started with E. coli, then moved into staff, progressed into uh, super bugs. That, that was definitely more challenging in terms of getting a, a, a decent biohazard cabinet for me and uh, all of the ensuing equipment required to test safely. And it, it took off from there. We then turned to James because we needed funding uh, for further preclinical tests as we moved out of in vitro and into in vivo. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a wonderfully inventive space, Western Australia. I'm, I'm a former WA boy. I moved over to Sydney uh, about five years ago, but the inventiveness of uh, and the willingness of capital to have a go. I've always said there's not a lot of venture in Australian capital, but the willingness of Western Australia uh, capital to have a go is, I think, above and beyond anywhere else. So I started, we have a philosophy of good people and great science and backing good people, we discovered that great science and I was the first investor uh, supporting uh, that what we've believed to be great science. And as that science um, proved true, it is only natural to follow the science and to continue in my instance to invest in the early capital rounds. Uh, I then naturally as any good investment case goes, your friends and family come in with you and then their friends uh, become involved. And we really built out as far as we could with private equity as in our own private capital. There's no, there's no traditional venture capital stacking the thing and hiving it off. It was about getting it to the ASX, uh, getting a, a wider capital pools available, outlining the path um, of commercialization and seeking to deliver on that. And I think we've certainly done a good job. So being the number one biotech suggests that uh, you are. Well, it's, it's pretty flattering, but there yeah. you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you appear across multiple infectious disease inpatients. Can you talk us through these programs? Yeah, so really our, our programs is all focused upon unmet medical needs and, and we're not wishing to do the same thing, expecting a different answer by way of combining antibiotics. So we look to the unmet medical need, particularly of bacterial blood poisoning. Now, bacteria in the blood is not supposed to be there. It's known as sepsis. So uh, the pipeline focused upon that one initially was to design a compound that's, uh, that can be IV infused attracted to, bind to, and interact with that bacteria 
at patient presentation, every hour left untreated, the likelihood of survival decreases by 8%. So <clears throat> that program is focused upon the unmet medical need. It is the most expensive condition treated in health and double the second most. We're actually the most advanced uh, clinical stage new class of antibiotic in the world. And we're the most advanced clinical stage sepsis drug candidate in the world, all from little old Western Australia, we would have thought. Uh, the other uh, drug candidates we have is utilising that as a topical uh, spray agent. So as, it, as it's a liquid form, a small molecule compound uh, that's um, uh, soluble at all pHs from the blood to the opposite acidity of the stomach, sprayed on the infected burn wound or infected uh, tissue or, or skin surface. Uh, the other compound uh, utilising that same um, method of administration is diabetic ulcers uh, out of a New South Wales hospital. But then looking to other programs such as an inhalant or through a respirator type system for lung infections, perhaps tuberculosis or pneumonia, <coughs> uh, oral consumption for Helicobacter pylori, the um, bad bacteria that exists in the upper duodenum where we've demonstrated excellent capability uh, and all of these excellent capability uh, in vivo, some obviously in human, uh, we have a sinusitis program, so nasal administration getting into the upper sinus sinuses, all broad spectrum activity because the specificity of one bacteria versus another bacteria in these locations is null and void. You've got an infection, you want to get on top of it, and you want to work and keep on working with repeated use. So as we look across our portfolio approach that is our company, we really have an arsenal of new compounds uh, against these major unmet medical needs. Thank, thank, thank you, Jones. Uh, very well uh, stated. And I, I think I'd like to add that in the case of um, sepsis, blood infections, that uh, scenario lends itself very well to the unique, the unique properties of our compound. For example, it's, we've got to get in quickly and treat uh, in a critical care scenario. So our, um, our lead candidate, Ricky327, will operate with a universal mechanism of action. So we don't need to wait for uh, time delays to identify the bacterium, do the susceptibility testing and so, so forth. The doctor can administer straight away intravenously and get that infection under control quickly. Um, also, so a lot of uh, infections eventually lead into sepsis. So for example, pneumonia, uh, wound infections, Urinary tract infections uh, is a big one, and we're currently investigating a phase two trial for urinary tract infection. Yeah, I kind of missed that one, didn't I? That's quite yes. an opportunity for us. Sorry about that. No, quite yeah. right. We have a broad program, so yes, keep it. Isn't it? But that one's really chasing the science in the context of we didn't actually have an initial interest in UTI infections, but through our IV administration, where we've gone a, a two and, a, and a, above in some instances, uh, 6,000 milligrams of IV infusion over a one hour period. We actually noticed through that study in the urine collection that we're getting some 15, 18 times concentration residing in the urinary tract. Well, when the compound goes from your vascular system through your kidneys down into the urinary tract, that lends itself to the ideal properties of a UTI uh, therapy. So obviously where the preliminary infection and for sepsis, 25% of sepsis, septic cases start in the urinary tract. Mm. So potentially to have a whole treatment model where the early uh, precursor to sepsis, UTI infections in a complicated or whatever state through to the more advanced, which become kidney infections through to the really advanced, which are your septic infections to have that one compound that's potentially able to um, have capability through that entire um, uh, therapeutic tract or, or UTI tract itself. So certainly with the insights as that uh, tech, as the human clinical study presented comes new opportunities and we're chasing those down. Awesome. So on a global health stage, what does the uniqueness of your compound mean for patients? Well, I think certainly it, it, it empowers clinicians uh, to stop infection at patient presentation is, is the, what we've demonstrated many, many times in animals. Our phase one has demonstrated the compound to be safe and well tolerated, but really it's a sign of new hope in the fight against superbugs. There hasn't been a new class of antibiotics in over 40 years. And I think re-empowering clinicians with a tool that can uh, lead to better patient, we believe lead to better patient outcomes uh, can only be a good thing. 
Yes, thank you, James. Personally, it's a worry to me as a microbiologist. We've got a resistance now in every class of antibiotics. Oops. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Uh, thanks, sir. Uh, and it's only increasing. Uh, so, and there's also now infections that just can't be treated. So, for example, uh, in gonorrhea, uh, I also uh, recently, whilst uh, presenting at the World Antimicrobial Resistance Congress, that was just last month in Washington, D.C., um, it, it's really coming to a fore. The, the climate there of uh, concern is definitely there. And uh, I did recently read a book uh, by a cystic fibrosis patient uh, in her 20s. It's called Salt in My Soul by uh, Mallory Smith and, and died in her 20s for want of an antibiotic that could treat her, uh, her infection. Um, so, yes, it, it's So that's kind of hinting excellent. at one that we didn't mention, but we are kind of having a little go in that space too because the underlying bacterial infection, mm. which is the go or no-go to the ability for CF patients to have a lung transplant, is em, em obsessus? Is that what it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They yeah. need to be ideally cleared of infection before they qualify as a candidate for lung transplant. So um, any bacteria we've put our compound against, we've, we've managed to work and work with the same concentrations as we, we would in its resistant form or otherwise. So I think as Michelle's hinting there, we, we have a few other tricks up our sleeve, but we'll see along the way. That's so exciting, which leads on to the next question. Um, Commercialisation of new antibiotics is really challenging. Uh, can you talk us through some of the major barriers and how Recky are addressing them from the scientific perspective, maybe Michelle, and from the commercialization perspective, James? Yeah, look, certainly I think, um, you know, people are not stupid and doing the same thing, expecting a different answer. Firstly, well, that, yes, that is a little stupid. But then if you do get something and you expect this old technology to be priced today in a, in a high value context when it's it's like me trying to sell somebody a, a 1970s car and say oh she's as good as today's tesla it's not so so unless you have a technology that fundamentally delivers true value it ain't going to be priced accordingly and of course the comp the challenge of doing the same thing as all the rest is drug resistance the same um, simple mechanism of action by the time you get to market the bacteria have mutated to overcome it Ours, of course, is try, it has positioned and has demonstrated and our patents around the world have granted supporting it and similar, is that you have a technology that works and keeps on wor uh, working with repeated use. A technology that will reduce the pharma economic burden to the hospitals, benefit the patients, and obviously support certainly in the US, the private health insurers, demonstrates value. And with that value, I think you can break that challenge business model that antibiotics have, have uh, have had and amazingly continue to have to this day. Thank you, James. In terms of science, I really believe we've passed the major hurdles to get where we are now. For example, let's say that there's a breadth of antibiotic compounds we can choose from to treat infections. Now, so many of them will, will fail in vitro because, for example, they, they might kill bacteria but they will fail in the, in the serial passage. They're going to lose their potency as you repeatedly expose bacteria. Uh, so that important proof of concept will be put together to secure global uh, patents for our suite of compounds. Then you've got to jump from in vivo to uh, in vitro to in vivo. You've got to do all of the safety the toxicology. Now, for an example, uh, bleach will, will kill bacteria very well, but we'd never treat humans with it because it would <laughs> kill them or, or poison them. So we've had to do a breadth of intensive- uh, Yeah, unless you're Trump, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Safety, uh, pharmacokinetics, tracing the molecule, uh, how it's excreted, absorbed, uh, the toxicology, every human system, how's it going to affect uh, respiratory, cardiac, uh, central nervous system, all of those systems have to be looked at when you jump from in vitro to in vivo. Now, that's a huge leap. We've passed successfully. Now we have to go from in vivo preclinical into clinical, and, and that's a jump. So we estimate carefully what's a safe human dose, go through the ethics committee, 
and we won our first clinical trial uh, here in Australia. Uh, that's currently on, on its last cohort in Adelaide at CMAX Clinical Research and going well. So we started at 50 milligrams and we've exponentially gone right up to a 6,000 milligram dose, good profile, and importantly, again, the next leap, well, are you in an efficacious dosing range? Who, who cares you might be safe and tolerated, but is it going to treat somebody who's sick? And we're in that ballpark range and doing further studies on pharmacokinetics. So I, I would well argue and believe we, we've passed those major hurdles. So many drug candidates bomb out along the way. Uh, before us, yes, there's challenges, but it's, it's in humans optimising doses, uh, looking at different infections and so forth. So, yes, I'm, I'm excited. Having been there at the very beginning, gowned up and, and playing with superbugs, to be now being in a, in a lovely environment in a hospital. Um, <laughs> and I think it, the, on the commercial side yeah. is too, it's, it's okay to fail. I mean, you don't do experiments knowing the answer. It's an experiment. And ideally, certain parameters in the experiment do fail so that you have a nice cluster that you're seeking. That was the goal, but you have the outside, obviously, through the uh, controls to tell you what's what was and wasn't going on. Um, why is our compound 327? Well, that's scientific journal number three, page 27. It's that process of elimination that is that discovery to uh, move to then move into the process Michelle talks about. But to really uh, as fully address your question as well, um, you can have the most rocket science compound, but unless you can manufacture it economically, which traditional antibiotics have huge cultivation processes, a lot of cap capex cost, a lot of expensive raw, raw waste and, and often expensive raw materials. Well, we obviously through the um, beginning with the end in mind process, designed a compound that's you know, water, polyethylene glycol, acrolene, and a synthetic meth method of manufacture. So 100% yield, inexpensive raw materials, and 100% or close enough to in its um, QA, QC of, of manufacture process, which, which, which gives a high margin opportunity to potentially come into the generic markets along the way as well. We talk a lot in WA about trying to keep opportunities, uh, capabilities and facilities in Australia. Um, and you've got a manufacturing facility in Sydney. Could you please walk us through your decision to keep those facilities on shore? Yes, well, certainly the R&D rebate is an incredibly attractive um, uh, initiative of the Australian government. The R&D rebate obviously being the 43 and a half cents in the dollar. Um, that has been a lifeblood uh, for our company and companies like us uh, to begin with. And, you know, even just from the putting on the investor hat, I give you a dollar, the dollar's out, what do I do? Well, actually, when I give you a dollar, the R&D rebate in, in this instance will, will further validate 43 and a half cents of that dollar. So your true cash runway is, you know, call it for simplicity, a dollar 43 and a half. Well, that's pretty good. Like you get a lot more bang for your buck by doing it here in Australia. Uh, and certainly we've used likes of Radium Capital, who's, who's with us today at different stages to bridge that time gap or bridge that gap between um, a result and another result, trying to create the, the new value. Uh, but in why Sydney and Eastern States? Um, first of all, it's, there's a terminology, it's a bit crass, but there ain't no pharmaceuticals in Australia. There's marketing and sales, not a lot of development, although those, those who do are very innovative but you've got eight tenths of the population, nine tenths of the capital in the Eastern States and a, a surrounding more prominent workforce there to support manufacture of a pharmaceutical compound on Pill Hill in Macquarie Park. Uh, <laughs> I, love, I, love to, I laugh slightly because I once said, uh, we're next to AstraZeneca, uh, our manufacturing there. And a, co a former colleague of ours runs over and he goes, AstraZeneca's next to us. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So we're positioned out there among the big boys and, that's a nice stepping stone beyond. Awesome. So what advice would you give to other businesses who are looking to scale outside of WA? What do you reckon, Michelle? So what, what advice? What, what advice would you give other businesses looking to grow outside of WA? Oh, I think, think, think big, but I think concentrate, get, get things uh, established as much as you can 
in Australia because it is risky uh, having to go overseas. And we were careful to do that. So we, uh, we, we kept all, all of the uh, proof of concept, microbiology work locally in Perth, manufactured in Sydney, and then made, made uh, inroads uh, into the US where we're uh, aiming to, to lodge uh, an application for an FDA IND. So certainly having a good solid home base and using that to then springboard to uh, your important connections, whether they be in Europe or in the US, uh, primarily in our case. And I think stick to your knitting as well in the context of we started as a West Australian company. We are a West Australian company. Uh, we've in fact just, just hired a new person at, at our facility in Bentley Technology Park from here in Perth. And, and she seems wonderful. I can't wait to, to work with her and the team there. But everybody will tell you you're wrong. Everybody's an expert, but if they knew anything about anything, they'd be doing it. They don't, they just talk about it. So instead you've got to back yourself, know uh, what you represent, where you're going and believe in your technology. And if you don't, that's okay, but just be conscious of that um, and take that step because nobody's going to tell you you're right. They'll always tell you you're wrong. And it's the silent, that is the, that's where the bliss is. That means you're doing okay. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. So you The human health problem is is global, and certainly the patient population uh, in Bangladesh, India, and surrounds is is major. Uh, I think. We have a responsibility to technology and shareholders to take a stepped tiered approach. Uh, neonatal, that's a very vulnerable patient uh, to go from, um, she's looking good here, boys, let's jump out there and you know go into a vulnerable patient that's, and, and it's something to go wrong. They may have an underlying something that we're not aware of and they drop dead through no fault of the technology. Nobody else is gonna use it. So you instead have to, I believe, take a stepped approach demonstrate efficacy in a, in a more simplistic infection, demonstrate in a more controlled in, environment, demonstrate in a, a um, country that has uh, good association, better association and commonalities with uh, our Australian practice, and then step out into the wider, wider network. But certainly uh, that, that is a, uh, a, an opportunity or, or an unmet medical need that we, we may look to be part of along the way. Awesome, any other questions? Yes. And you sort of talked about the low manufacturing costs and, and how you design the employee. Is, is that your, uh, your response to try to address that challenge? We only focus upon unmet medical needs, so not met by existing antibiotics. Uh, it's the all the areas we've re referred to areas are not currently addressed by those. I think the, the low cost, frankly, is particularly focused upon generics um, in that space. And really, if you're a me too selling an old technology, they're going to price it accordingly. Um, when we look to, I mean, the average sepsis patient in US dollar terms is about 150,000 US dollars. You only got to price it at anything sub that, and they've got a major cost saving and benefit to both clinician patient and the uh, industrial burden as a whole. So uh, we're not concerned uh, on the pricing. I think the technology will lend itself to, to the real value that can be represented there. And I think actually, when we look to what were some of the, some of the people say, oh, you know, the pricing is not good. You're still getting like $10,000 a vial in, in um, just some of the periphery areas. Remember we were looking through the clear view but you were constantly getting data feedback from experts uh, in the area for our own um, interests. And some of them are like many, many, many antibiotics, still $10,000 a vial, mm. uh, pretty attractive. Yeah, true. So that, that is an area we've been looking carefully at as we head towards commercialisation is engaging top uh, consultants to look at all of the various markets, the pricing and what goes on in, in the hospital in terms of nominating an antibiotic, pricing it and getting it used to treat patients. So all of that's been uh, carefully looked at now. Yeah. Um, I have a question. 
research and the research combined with the video from research studies to examine the effect on the prescription and so forth. Mm -hmm. And of course, here there's a lot of research on gut health actually, and I I'm not sure if you mentioned that in your list of CMS and those other questions, but um, how, how do you how, how have you tested it? Um, knocking out your good, good bacteria in the gut, that sort of thing, and how that would yeah. Sure, James, can you just... Yeah, yeah, so, um, so the question is uh, related. So Michelle's clinically deaf, so I bec only... No, it's no trouble, that's... No, no, it's no trouble, and yeah. only through my many, many... Michelle knows my voice and lip reads. Um, so, Michelle, through the uh, studies that we've done, and, of course, in your great list of them, you couldn't name all, um, how are we confident that we don't have a negative effect on the microbacterium? Um, so for oh, prompt. in the microbiome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. How, how do we, you know, the animal Yeah, thank you. We, we do get asked in. that uh, frequently. Um, we are presently uh, conducting a study where we're going to look at uh, how it has affected the microbiome and, and quantifying and identifying um, bacteria, you know, before treatment and, and following treatment. Um, it is an area of importance, uh, you know, because of the function, of course, of the micro. Uh, biome in the gut and also we don't want a secondary uh, clostridium infection moving in. Where our drug more is placed though is that we're looking at life-threatening infections. So in that scenario the effect on the microbiome yes will, will be secondary to, to saving a life and you know all things being well we've saved the life then we could then if we do have ill effect on microbiome then treat that patient to have their gut flora restored and optimised. We have nevertheless, so that's in a classically scientific specific looking just at microbacterium of the gut. In the animal models, you look at body weights. How much are they drinking? How much are they eating? How much weight are they putting on or losing? And they don't change, like it's, which suggests, although it's not perfect, but suggests that it's not harming the microbacterium in the healthy human population, which has been IV uh, dosed, uh, uh, there's, I don't know, about 70 uh, volunteers. Um, nobody's shitting their pants. Nobody, everybody's eating. Everybody's fine. Um, so, no, that's not specific to looking at the microbacterium. But you can be damn sure that if you do have a negative effect on microbacterium, you kind of know about it through the animal studies or human, and we haven't had any concern there. Yeah, thank you, James. Good point. So, yeah, in the TOC studies, the effect on the uh, GIT... Uh, has has been yeah minimal so yeah encouraged it. Mm -hmm. it, it, it seems to be spread quite early through a public history. Yeah. Um, if you had your time to just run some rounds, you did that or do it the same way again. It's that's a very good question. I do think about the, the simple challenge in Australia is we haven't got a lot of venture in Australian capital. Uh, the private equity space, certainly in Western Australia, to have um, uh, investable risk capital, essentially, is very, very small. Um, in the eastern states, uh, there's some, but very difficult to target, difficult to access. The venture capital firms want to package the thing up, quick flip at the price of the technology in the context of you might get a commercial sec success, but you'll be hiving off the technology and it may never see the light of day. So to, we, balancing everything up, we did step onto the ASX uh, early, um, but the ASX, as long as sticking to all the rules, et cetera, as the ASX provides, creates a platform to communicate and a platform to communicate uh, can be invaluable. Uh, you know, you have these breaks. We, we, had, we, had one, we intentionally had a go in gonorrhea, not because we're that interested in gonorrhea, um, but we wanted a news flow event. Uh, I shouldn't say that, but that's what it was. So, <laughs> so we, we did this thing, got this gonorrhea test, knocked it out. It was great. And then all over the newspaper, Bondi backpackers rejoice, gonorrhea cure in the pipeline. So it's kind of, so only through those public platforms can you sometimes get a, a better um, uh, audience. And, and it also creates a platform to continue to attract new capital as there are capital rounds that flow it's just so difficult in a you know a little in a little private company with no particular um rigor or governance that's required by the asx has its pros and cons well, hi. 
You mentioned before about going to the antimicrobial resistance uh, congress. Um, to your absolute testament, Rocky was invited to do the opening address at the Congress. Um, you're clearly leading the global efforts in this area. From your perspectives, what were the big takeaways from the Congress? Oh, look, in a nutshell, for me, I, I was privileged to present there. For me, I think that the takeaway from a lot of the delegates, uh, maybe not said out loud, but what I picked up was, what are we going to do? <laughs> what are we going to do? Everyone's trying so hard to knock over resistant infection, infections and to find a drug that's going to keep on working after repeated use. And uh, I think that that's what I definitely uh, picked up on and, and, and took back home. And I was very glad to, to know and to present what I believe is a real answer uh, to to the problem of uh, antimicrobial resistance. And... Yeah, it's, um, I think over the, the, the attempts and failures through doing the same thing, expecting a different answer, um, has seen the lower hanging fruit or the quick commercial opportunity moving to diagnostics, medical devices, you know, identify the bacteria, uh, that's great, but you need, in my opinion, you, you then need something useful to tackle that infection. But 80 plus percent of um, what's really going on in the antibiotic space is medical devices identifying the bacteria for, for quicker susceptibility, if any susceptibility at all. Uh, one of the, there's always great insights in going to these conferences. It's frankly, it's a, it's a bit daunting going there. You've got, you know, very, very, very senior people from Congress and Pfizer and so on and so forth. And they're there talking to you and you asking, you know, who are you and why should I talk to you? And it's, quite daunting but what you really discover is the unknown or the unexpected things like they'll go look i've spent 10 billion on this cancer thing these guys aren't living long enough because they're getting infected could we use your stuff extend the, the cancer treatment lifestyle cycle and i might get my money back it's like well they're not interested in having a useful antibiotic for antibiotic purposes they're interested in broadening uh, their uh, cancer consumption drug pipeline through because of course with immunotherapy you lower the immune system the bacteria sp spread uncontrolled so it's sometimes the unexpected that uh, when you speak to these guys hey you got a 10 billion dollar pipeline that's not being consumed as readily as you like well we might be able to help with that it's uh it was it was mm. it's always fun yes yes at that conference i saw such a lot of superb research and a lot of money being spent fabulous presentations with every endpoint you could wish for and so forth but it would always be something like first in class and the next presentation first in class and I I'm, we need a new class we need a new class yeah as as good and as brilliant as that work was we need a new class mm -hmm. Wonderful. And a big part of that, as you stated before, is building the right team and investing in your team. Um, but recruiting and retaining talent, especially in our current environment, can be a real challenge for companies. Yeah. Um, how has the company gone about addressing it? Oh, human resources. Uh, it's, we've, we've had a journey, frankly. Um, I can tell you what not to do, um, and I can tell you those that we are with now are my privilege is working with good people i can't judge the science until the results come through and then i get the joy of that but working with good people you have every chance of success um retaining those people i think the science does a great job of that uh, people really do we do have a, an, an excellent culture not afraid to have a laugh um you know the first time, I shouldn't say the story, but anyway, first time my, my marketing director guy comes over and meets, per, meets Michelle in Perth, she does a bacterial swab of his moustache and starts cultivating it out. He thought it was funny. It's probably, probably not the best way of introducing people, but, but, um, but having a little laugh, hey, yeah, you know, there might be something weird on your Mexican looking moustache. Let's try to find out. But um, you can have... Do drop by. <laughs> he still got it. Yeah, yeah. It, was a, it had a lot less bacteria than I would have thought. I mean, that thing's... <laughs> Things awful, but yes, uh, I think too in human resources uh, for our company. Uh, I've been recently interviewing uh, candidates for a, an assistant for our clinical trials, 
and having uh, John Prendergast join the board and uh, another director, Alan Dunton. And what's been a common thread there is that, yeah, people have to be qualified in a practical sense, but what draws them and what, what you know, why we welcome them is, is they catch the excitement, they get yeah. the, the concept underpinning the technology. So uh, a candidate recently said to me, and she could, she was very excited. In fact, just to say, oh, I'm, I'm in, <laughs> I'm in, you know, pl please let me join. And, and that's really for our human resource, people that believe in the technology and will go that extra mile when, when things can get challenging uh, to make it work. So it's really great to, yeah, to have that backing, not only in a technical sense, but in a, in a personal sense, people that are committed and and believe believe in the concept. And and to always hire smarter. I mean, if it's not obvious, neither Michelle or I have doctorates. I'm the CEO, she's the co-founder, co and we hire the most brilliant people. And everybody gets to benefit from doing that. So never feel that you're not good enough or you can't do it because of some piece of paper or some other bullshit. You can. And you can build a wonderful team around you that everybody synergistically feeds off each other. Beautiful. Are there any final questions? Yes, Michelle. Um, what do you think, um, what's your feeling towards um, the uptake of your technology compared to what's currently available to be? There's always scepticism, uh, frankly. Uh, it's too good to be true. Oh, that couldn't be possible. And I understand that. I'd be frightened too. I mean, changing change is uh, is concerning. A new category. I mean, look at Tesla, by example. Everybody, it was the most shorted stock, or which in simple terms is the most bet against stock or betting that it'll go down stock on, on the American exchange for a number of years. Now it's one of the best performers and a whole new category. I see this, this technology as a new category, a new category in infectious diseases, and a new sign of, um, of hope in the fight against superbugs. And I really see at the time clinicians or the, or the broader clinician uh, network may, may consider our technology that, uh, that learning or adoption of the, of the technology should speak for itself. But every day is always pessimists. You only have to you know, raise your head up and someone will want to whack it down. So it's just the nature of the game. Mm, I think too, looking at the data in a dispassionate way, as well is important. And I always make sure that I do that. Um, we've had our data, preclinical data reviewed uh, by the uh, group at infectious disease group at the FDA. So we, we flew over there, they've looked at our preclinical data, they're dispassionate people. <laughs> and uh, they awarded the company qualified infectious disease uh, pathogen status, which uh, qualifies us uh, at at the appropriate time for expedited review and 10 years of market exclusivity upon commercialization. So uh, they're, they're tough customers uh, to win over. Uh, and also in securing the global patents, I mean, trying to get through uh, a patent examiner it is tough, very, very tough. And, uh, but we've been awarded patents in all the major pharmaceutical markets. So, that's reassuring, reassuring. We'll let the data speak, follow the data. Beautiful. That's a brilliant place for us to end today. So thank you so much for letting us pick your brain. Thank you. Um, this is the last uh, MPD sector spotlight for the year. So we look forward to coming back in 2023. Um, and I want to say a huge thank you for stepping into the spotlight. Well, I, I really want to say a big thank you to MT, MTP Connect, particularly, I, I reference, quite frankly, why did we leave Western Australia, why did I leave Western Australia to, uh, to develop the East Coast? Because there ain't no pharmaceuticals. There was such little support, there was such little platform and um, recognition for the importance of science. MTP Connect has really represented that, and it is flattering to be able to come here and actually have somebody else out singing out singing our voice and the voice of the west australian science community so i think you're onto a good thing and it's great to be part of it
relation to uh, pharmaceutical science and pharmacology. What's called the first, the uh, There's actually going to be on a Monday, the 28th of November, there'll be a full day symposium here on patient history in the pharmaceutical sector. So I encourage any of you interested in that to, to register and give you the link, and they'll come out through the, the uh, PC. Um, We've got the keynote will be from the uh, Vice President of Discovery Biology at AstraZeneca. So Steve Reese, OBE, we've got an OBE project to work uh, developing the uh, testing in the UK for COVID 19. So really encourage you on the platform of biotech, on the platform of bioengineering, now the platform of pharmaceutical science. It's happening, isn't it? Yeah. I would have, frankly, I would have never, never thought, but it's, I'm thrilled to say it. And that sounds a good event. That's a good one. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much for joining us, folks, and thanks for joining us.